My guest this week is world-renowned vegan chef Jason Weirich. Jason is based out of Arizona and owns a food delivery service called The Vegan Taste. I had the privilege of ordering food from his company, and the way the food gets delivered is every Monday morning, a cooler is dropped off outside your door. When you bring the cooler in, you unload these microwave-safe packages that contain all the meals. You have the choice of either microwaving the meals or taking the contents and heating it up on the stove. He had a health scare in his late 20s with type 2 diabetes, and we talk about his passion for food and how going from college being a psychology major to eventually becoming a world-renowned chef, a co-author of a book with Dr. Neil Barnard called The 21 Day Weight Loss Kickstart. And Jason has also written two books of his own, Vegan Mexico and Vegan Tacos. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's very educational and explains the path to a lifestyle of being vegan and how you can do this in small stages and eventually make the choice to go all vegan or even keeping some of the meals as part vegan, part whatever you're normally eating. So sit back and enjoy this episode on vegan food with world-renowned chef Jason Weirich. Welcome, Chef Jason Weirich. This has been a long time coming for me. I have looked forward to interviewing you the moment I tasted the food that was delivered to my house. So here we are, and I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, and I really appreciate the time and you actually saying yes to me. So thank you so much and welcome. Well, you're welcome. I appreciate you having me on here. Yeah, man. This is uh, the, the way this came about for me was I got a flyer in the mail, and it was one of those things like come to this free healthy dinner um to hear some I, I don't know it was some sort of talk about healthy eating and nutrition and it happened to be from a nutritionist uh, a, a company in town like a an office in town and i went and uh, and i i got pulled into it i you know the the food we had was great but it wasn't necessarily vegan it was just healthy uh but then when i got into the program which was not cheap by the way but I felt I was worth it. Um, they started to say, you know, do all this blood work. And then we found out my, I knew my cholesterol was always a little high. Uh, so their program is doing vegan for 30 days on their menu. And then from there, you, uh, you know, you, the hope is you stay with it or you alter it a little bit or whatever. So that's how I got into this. And the problem for me was I literally was so busy, I did not have the time to prep my food. It was taking me like half days on Saturdays, half days on Sundays, and I was like, my weekend is shot, and I've prepped all this food, and and I, you know, any small amount of time I had was gone. So then I really went on the hunt for trying to find healthy vegan food that I could just literally eat and not do anything with it. I had already done, uh, I think I did Sun Basket a while back, you know, all the food prep things that you know of and we talk about. Um, so that's how you and I got connected. I, I, I don't even know how I ended up finding you. I think it was just purely, I was so desperate doing a Google search and, and I found you and I was like, sold. I mean, I can just heat it and eat it, right? That's, that's your thing. It's just heat and eat. So here we are. So I want to start from um, wherever you want to start. I, I know that this was a health thing for you in, in combination of other things, but knowing the stories that I've read and interviews I've seen of you, um, that this came about more for a health reason initially for you. Um, and, and then it just blew up from there and then it became your passion, which is really cool to me because this is what I preach on the show and on my videos is that I want people to live more fulfilled lives doing what they love. And it's cool that you went into that direction knowing some of your past, which you can talk about on how this all started for you. So take it away. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it was, uh, 
kind of a winding journey, I think. I mean, like, it it seems kind of straightforward when you look at it. I was unhealthy. I went vegan. I got my health back. Hooray. Um, but that's uh, that's really not how it started. I mean, it, it it's starts when I'm a little kid because uh, I think I didn't eat great, but I didn't eat bad um, for the kind of regular American diet, um, which meant, you know, my mom cooked some of the meals and occasionally ordered out. Uh, and I played sports all the time. I was always active. So I was a super healthy, real thin kid. And then as I got older, um, towards the end of high school and in college, uh, I kept eating the same way I had been eating the last few years. And the last few years had changed because uh, my mom went to work. She got busier. And so our food choices changed to um, what, which one of these seven different chicken dishes do you want tonight <laughs> that I know how to make? <laughs> or would you like Taco Bell or uh, Burger King or Pizza Hut or something like that? And so when I stopped playing sports all the time and was super active, uh, the calorie intake and, and honestly, like the terrible food I was eating started to catch up with me. And so I, I probably put on 30 pounds from when I was 16 to uh, probably 19 and just kept going up about 10 pounds a year from there. So I was already getting overweight. And then uh, right at the end of college, I started learning how to cook. So I went to, uh, I went to this really great Egyptian restaurant in Fort Worth. Uh, where I went to college, had the uh, had this amazing meal. It was the first amazing meal I'd ever had. And I was like, I want to learn how to eat like this. And I'm broke because I'm in college. <laughs> so I started to learn how to cook for myself. Uh, and then right after that, it was like two months after that, um, I went vegetarian. And that was solely for ethical reasons. No real idea of the health impact or anything like that. Um, that it has, I didn't care at the time. I was just going to keep eating food that was uh, super tasty and not worry about the health part. So of course, even going vegetarian, I kept gaining weight. In fact, I was kind of a, a stupid vegetarian. I'll just be blunt about it. I took the meat I was eating and I replaced it with blocks of cheese. So <laughs> instead of these Instead of like these super fatty steak fajitas loaded with sour cream and cheese that I was eating before, now I was uh, eating uh, cheese lovers pizza from Pizza Hut and the additional topping was extra cheese. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh <my> God. <laughs> and that was, that was my dinner. I was with someone at the time. She had her own pizza. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was, it was terrible. And so I became incredibly overweight. I weighed about 330 pounds uh, and I got type two diabetes by the time I was in my mid twenties. Uh, and I was, I was faced with having to take insulin for the rest of my life and, and basically starting to deteriorate uh, even more. Like I was already deteriorating. My eyesight sucked sleeping 10 to 12 hours a day. I mean, everything you can think of with type two diabetes was going wrong with me. So I was facing having to take medication and deteriorate for the rest of my life, which was probably not going to be that long at this point or change my diet. And so it's, it's funny because I was, I'd been vegetarian for five years and I had, I had heard of vegans, but I didn't really know what they were. Uh, and I even made fun of them a little bit. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, and this was back in the late nineties. And then all of a sudden it's 2001 and I'm, I'm faced with having to make this, this choice. Do I, uh, do I give up this food that I love, which is cheese, um, and live a better life or do I keep going with the cheese? And, and it's funny because even though it, it sounds like a no brainer, like eat cheese and die or give up cheese and regain your health. I mean, it sounds like an obvious choice. Right, but there's so much uh, there's so much pain involved in a lifestyle change that the stress of that uh, was really bad in itself, and and going vegan in 2001 when really no one else around me was was vegan. Man, I had to learn how to cook. I had to learn how to fend for myself. I had to completely change all these foods that I knew um, how to make and eat when I was growing up, and so it was super stressful at first. 
And so I relaxed a little bit and decided I was going to give myself a cheat day. So I was going to be a cheating vegan once a week. Uh, so every Wednesday night I had to go out and, and I get all you can eat enchiladas at my favorite Mexican restaurant. And they bring them out in pairs to so bring two enchiladas at a time. And the first time I went in there, the waiter was like, okay, yeah, whatever. It's cool. It brings out enchiladas, except I eat 14 of them. Oh my gosh. And then I come back the next week and all of a sudden the waiter's like, hmm. Cause I eat another 14 enchiladas. <laughs> so by the third week, the waiter's like, I hate you, but I have to serve you anyway. Right? You're like the, <laughs> you're like the, all you can eat buffet crab right. guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably familial in some way because I know my, my middle brother would go to uh, Mongolian stir fry places and he'd take the bowl and he'd see how much he could pack in the bowl because it was one pass through. And so he'd, he'd have the regular bowl and it'd only come up like three inches. And then there was like the six inch pile of stuff on top of oh it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so there must be something familial about that, that buffet all you can eat thing. Uh, so I, I, but anyway, the, the point is I, I did that for a few months and even then I managed to start losing weight and my symptoms went away. So I'd be vegan for the entire week except for this one, uh, one rather egregious cheat meal, but it was still just one meal. And then it went to once every other week when I would go to this place and then once a month. Uh, and then I remember the last time I purposely had, uh, went to this place and, and ordered cheese and I ordered in the enchiladas and I, uh, it, it was a weird experience because I looked at them and I realized they didn't taste good to me anymore. And they didn't have that, uh, that feeling you get when you eat cheese that Homer Simpson, like donut feeling when you eat dairy. <laughs> so I didn't have that anymore. They didn't taste good. And I realized I was ordering them out of habit and not because I actually wanted them. So I didn't even eat the enchiladas. I pushed them away, paid the waiter who probably side relief that, it, right. uh, that I was getting out of there. <laughs> and that was the last time I ever stepped foot in that place. Um, and, and at that point I was a full on vegan, which took me about eight months. Um, and it also coincided with me completely getting rid of diabetes. And wow. after the first year I dropped about 60 pounds. And then when I added in some real exercise, uh, I dropped the, another 60. So I dropped about 120 pounds over two years. That's incredible. Um, and I think yeah, what people need to understand uh, about you is you're a big guy. Like I know from the interviews and stuff, you're six, three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, and, and I think at one point you said you, you went to school and lived in San Antonio, Fort Worth, Fort Worth. Sorry. So you're like in state town. Yeah. I mean, right? <laughs> the name of Fort Worth is Cowtown. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So that must be, that must be hard. It's just the, the stigmatism with, you know, vegan and yoga and all of those kind okay. of things, right? It's tough. It depends. So, okay. It was weird because Texas is really interesting. I mean, I, I grew up here in Arizona, my, but my dad is Texan. And so, uh, so I was already pretty familiar with Texas uh, before I actually moved there for school and stayed there afterwards. And, Texas has this reputation of being big and boisterous and rednecky. Um, and it is, but it also has, uh, has this huge liberal side and has this huge health side. It has this huge vegan side to it. I mean, I remember when I was in college, I went to uh, the Texas vegetarian chili cook-off and this was in the mid nineties. And it was like this huge gathering of, of people from all over Texas doing this chili cook off. Um, and like uh, Texas had one of the biggest vegetarian societies uh, in the nineties, at least when I was there participating in that stuff. And so Texas is just this really cool mix of all these different things, um, religion and atheism and big hair money and uh, rebel activists and steak eaters and vegans and, and no one's quiet about it. I mean, maybe that's the one thing about Texas is, uh, is you know, everybody kind of gets by in the big city, but uh, they're, they're friendly, but boisterous uh, about that stuff, which makes it really cool. But anyway, 
that's my tangent on Texas. <laughs> no, but that's great because it's exactly you, you saying that is exactly th- how it educates people to know that it's not just big hats and boisterous voices and steak and whatever. It's, I, I had no idea that you would think that long ago people were vegan in yeah. the state of Texas. I mean, I think, I think Fort Worth had one of the first vegan restaurants in the country, um, which was Spiral Diner that opened up in 2001. Yeah. See, I don't think anybody would ever know that. Yeah. So that's, that's cool. Uh, so the tangent was great. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you are, this is what year now that you go full vegan. So that was the, I started at the beginning of 2001 and then I was full vegan by the end of 2001. Got it. Um, and I think, uh, I think I might be more like a lot of other people with this. Like, uh, you know, I've written books with a lot of the vegan doctors and usually their message is this all or nothing proposition. You go from zero to 60. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from a physiological standpoint, you're going to regain your health really fast that way. But if you're miserable doing it, chances are you're going to quit out. And so I think for a lot of people transitioning, as long as they have it in their mind that it is a transition, um, makes it easier for people. And so that's, that's what I did. It took me, it took me about eight months to fully transition over. Got it. Um, and, I, and I tried the zero to 60 approach for right. three weeks and it was, I was miserable. Yeah. And, and for me, the 30 day thing, I did not find hard. Um, I, the part I found hard about it was the meal prep. And that's literally what was difficult for me. Uh, the, and I even heard you in some other interviews, the good thing that we have going for us these days is that it's, it's much more accepted in the world. And when you go out to a restaurant, there are options that would have never been there 10 years ago. Yeah, there are. There are plenty of options, right. uh, which has made it an interesting landscape for vegan businesses. Uh, because I think in the past, uh, vegans gravitated towards vegan businesses because that mm-hmm. was their only choice. And now, at least in the Phoenix area, um, vegan businesses are just one amongst, uh, amongst a bunch of other vegan options. Right. But the, I think the key and the, the reason I was so excited to have you on is what helped me get through the, the, the next 30 days that they asked me to do because they could see that my cholesterol was dropping. So they were like, will you, are you willing to buy into doing it another 30 days? And towards the middle or end of the first is I think when I came across your website and then it was easier for me to say yes, because I literally just could not afford the time to meal prep. Right. Um, I, but, but besides that, the biggest thing for me was the taste. And I, I don't know, like this could be a trademark or something that I'm saying, but I didn't know vegan food could taste so good. <laughs> and you can steal it no, if you true. want. If it's not taken by somebody, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, that's what it was for me, man. I when I first dug into it, and the way I worked with you was that I wanted it spicy, which you were all down for. I think even when I I got from my doctor what I needed to do, he said, "Okay, well, if you're gonna get this food from the vegan taste, just make sure ask them if it's low in oil, right?" And it's and right. it, it everything was a yes. Like all, all you know, that was when I wrote to you, yes you know, it's either low or minimal oil or no oil. Um, and I can get it the way I like it. So you made it spicy, which is the way you said you liked it in the email. Right. So it was like the perfect marriage. I was like sold. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's the key to getting people to make a, a change. Um, it's about, honestly, I think it's like about the, in the environment that you put people in. So, uh, I know, Dan Boot, who wrote the Blue Zones diet. And uh, one of the things that he told me that really impacted the way I thought about uh, food and getting food to people and the way we treat people is that the 
the biggest determinant for someone making uh, choices that let them live a long time was not their willpower, was not uh, a doctor's prescription or anything like that. It was the environment in which they lived. And so if the choices were easy to make to go out and exercise, um, statistically speaking, more people would go out and exercise mm -hmm. uh, that way. And so to me, food is part of uh, the environment that you're in. And so the easier I can make it on someone to make a better choice for themselves, the bigger chance they are, uh, they're going to have to actually make that choice. And so for me, that's putting ready to eat meals in front of someone that's going to make them happy. The less you have to worry about it, the easier it is for you to be healthy. Yeah, it's, it was so nice to find the website. It was that I could hear the sound when the heavens open. <laughs> I was like, thank you. It's the only thing that's going to keep me on track. Now, you know, before we get too deep into this, I am not full vegan. Um, since doing the nutrition program, I've cut out a lot of like I would, use, I would snack before dinner. I'd be so hungry. I'd come home at four o'clock, whatever. And I'd, I'd pull out the, the block of cheddar cheese and some Triscuits and, you know, just take the edge off. I've, I've stopped doing that a lot more than I use, you know, it's, it's cut way back to almost minimal, you know, to, to none. Um, I don't drink, I used to drink half and half in my coffee. And now all I use is either oat milk or almond milk. So I've completely switched over to that type of stuff. So while we're on the, the subject of, of, you know, how this has helped you, why do you think dairy is so bad? Is it just that it like, was it not meant to be eaten or drank? Is, is it just like we've created this product that should not have existed? I think so. Um, I mean, dairy's primary use is to grow a baby and so you're you're consuming something that's meant to grow another being and as uh as adults we're not i don't think we're supposed to be consuming foods that are continuously making us grow to that scale like i have a five-year-old daughter i watch how much she eats um and sometimes she eats as much as i do because she she's always out there running around and she's like, I look at her and a week later, she's taller and I'm like, Oh my God. Um, and so calorically dense foods are good for her. I mean, that's why human mothers, uh, breastfeed and, and, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, but then when you stop growing and you keep eating those foods, you're consuming growth hormone and, and all this other stuff that I don't think we're meant to be consuming. Uh, and then, you know, there are a couple other issues that go with it, which it turns out casein, which is the protein in milk, uh, seems to be carcinogenic. Uh, even, even in that milk's appropriate species after they're weaning, it, it, seemed, uh, it seems like the incidence of cancer goes up in that species if they continue to consume milk even from their own species uh, after they're supposed to stop drinking it and then i mean look at us we're we're drinking stuff that's meant to grow a baby cow into this big monstrous cow compared to humans i mean a cow is, is pretty heavy uh so you know there's there's that it's um it's loaded up with fat and it's all if you have a cheese it's all condensed down into this calorically dense product with all these other uh all these other ingredients into it that are probably not meant for us to just get fuel and it's all like if you take milk milk's this big volume you take cheese and it like comes down into this little thing all that condensed down it's like a black hole of food um and then you're you're eating that so of course no wonder you're you know you're getting fat you're having arteriosclerosis uh, as you age and all these other problems um so that's why i think the the health problem is with dairy from a, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's uh, it was a good thing because you could have this nutrient dense food, uh, even in times of famine. That's um, that was one of the benefits of cheese because cheese was basically shelf stable um, in a 
you know, the long period of human history when uh, we didn't really have very many shelf-stable foods, uh, the same way that um, after fashion, beer is shelf-stable, which is one of the reasons that beer was created. Uh, you know, there are all these ways to preserve uh, foods during times of, of famine, and we just don't live in that anymore. Right. Um, so on the, the dairy part of this, what, I guess people have a hard time thinking of how they would substitute uh, cheese for these recipes. And I know that in, you know, you have this enchilada recipe and you, there's, I mean, you have a ton of different recipes. What are just some off the top of your head, some substitutes that, the, that you do use for cheese? If like, how would someone make a pizza? What would they put on it as their cheese? Uh, you know, it depends. There, there are a lot of non-dairy commercial cheeses out there. Uh, I think from a health standpoint, they're good insofar as you're not getting casein and all these hormones that go with it, but I can't pretend that they're a health food. Right. I mean, it's base, it's like cheese is solidified fat when it's dairy and the non-vegan cheeses are still solidified fat. Uh, they just don't have all the other junk that goes with them. So, uh, you know, if you, if you limit that, like if you're going to have a pizza and you have it once a week and you put some vegan cheese that's made out of almonds or cashews or something like that on it, you're going to be okay. If you do that every single day, uh, you're not going to be so okay anymore. Uh, you can still be a junk food vegan. In fact, it's easier now to be a junk food vegan than it is to be a healthy vegan because you can run over to Carl's Jr. and get a Beyond Burger um, that's you know still loaded up with all this fat and it's still a, a burger. Whereas when I went vegan uh, almost 20 years ago, if I was craving a burger, I had to make it myself. Right. Yeah, I mean, the creativity so that, that you have to come up with for these recipes must be daunting. I, sometimes, but only because I do a lot of recipes. Right. I mean, most, most chefs at a restaurant might do 30 recipes throughout the year if they're really pushing themselves. Uh, I think with the delivery service, we're doing 300 wow. every, every year. And each year, it's different. Yeah. Okay. So you're rotating 300 recipes a year th from the vegan taste. And we're just making them up as we cook them every week. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's daunting, but it's cool. Yeah. It's, um, um so yeah. I mean, and, and like back to the cheese thing, so sometimes it's replacing that, that fatty mouth, full mouth feel that cheese gives you. So you can even use something like an avocado or you can use, uh, uh, one of my favorites is this thing called Pipi and Verde, which is just this uh, uh, pepita and tomatillo puree. Uh, it's, it's a classic uh, Mexican dip. Um, and I'll just use that on enchiladas or we'll make our own uh, cheese at the restaurant. Sometimes we'll make it just out of uh, almonds and some other ingredients. We'll make our own queso fresco like that. Uh, we make our own mozzarellas and stuff, but that's a little laborious. I think for the for the home cook, it's just getting that that creamy texture, which you can get from nuts and seeds. Right. Yeah, because even on the recipes um, at Casatera, your restaurant, I saw that there was. Uh, I think you have is it brick oven pizzas or just yeah we have wood fire wood, wood fire oh, sorry wood fire yeah and so and i did see one of the recipes or one of the descriptions of the you know the pizza said mozzarella so i was like okay how is he doing that right it's just uh, uh when you get to that type of cheese that's um it's a little time consuming and it's a mix of uh art and chemistry yeah yeah it's just it's incredible. Um, so I, I, I know we just kind of skipped over it a little bit, but we talked about your daughter and, and, and I know we talked about, um, we didn't quite say that she's vegan, but I know that she is from based on my research about you. And I know it's tough with kids these days with all of the gluten allergies and, and everything that's going on that are used to be a lot tougher. Now it's, Parents are more aware. There are more options. And I would think 
that um, it's almost the same thing with your daughter as it is with a child that has a gluten allergy. When they go to a house for a birthday party, and let's just go back to using pizza as an example, because that's how I grew up, right? That your parents would buy a bunch of pizzas. And what does she do in that case? Or how, how do you let the parents know that she's vegan and that, you know, that isn't something she would A, like to eat or B, she shouldn't eat or C, it might make her sick if she eats it because she's not used to eating cheese? Uh, we just, we tell them and ask them not to make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. And then we make sure our daughter has food that totally owns everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> perfect that's awesome i mean when, when she was in school before covid hit the teachers were asking if we could bring stuff for them that is so funny i can imagine oh i listen i know what it smells and tastes like or every kid would be sitting there with their pizza or dominoes going wow what are you eating can I, i'll trade you i'll trade you two slices for that yeah. that's perffect well because she, she's totally vegan correct yeah that's amazing um so you, what is the Vicology Project? Is that how you say it? Vicology Project? Vicology. Vicology. Uh, so it's pretty much the umbrella for all the stuff that I do. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. And I, cause I know that you spoke about uh, the vegan taste, which is the home uh, delivery food service, uh, Casa Terra, which is the restaurant out in Glendale, Arizona. Right. And then, I, I heard you speak about other things potentially coming down down the road. So I assumed that that was the umbrella where all of these things would fall under. Yeah, I mean, we're working on uh, commercializing our cheeses on a large scale. Um, uh, we've already had uh, uh, one big vegan restaurant chain express some interest in it, uh, which was really cool. It came out of the blue, uh, but that was uh, that was a nice surprise. And, yeah. uh, and we just want to roll out really high quality vegan cheeses, uh, onto the, onto the food service market and then retail if we can. Uh, That's but if I can, I, I mean, if I can get like, uh, some of the best restaurants in Phoenix using high quality vegan cheeses, all of a sudden it opens up really great menu options for vegans around the entire town. Right. And, and I would I say... Think Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was hitting I, I on think, the, the dairy part of it, and I didn't even know that this underlying thing about the cheese had a, a, a broader uh, yeah. scope of what was happening. I just, I kind of chose the one thing that I know, like you, you know, it's like, how do you have ravioli? How do you have a pizza? How do you, if you, you're so used to having half and half in your coffee, how do you make the move away from dairy? And I think that's, I think that's harder almost than the meat part of this or the, or the, the protein part of it. Right. Uh, I didn't know why until Dr. Barnard told me a few years ago um, that the uh, casein in cheese is called a casomorphine. And that basically means it acts like morphine. It, it acts like an opiate in your system. And I was like, that makes sense because one day I just gave up meat and it was like, whatever. Mm-hmm. But when I gave up cheese, I had withdrawal symptoms. I was jonesing. I mean, like my hands were shaking and I had headaches and I was irritable and everything else that I had heard of from people that were trying to give up cigarettes or drugs or something like that. I was going through and I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> that was that was one way where I knew like I really better get off this stuff because if I'm having that reaction, this is probably pretty bad for me. Uh, but it was a few years later when he told me why. And so anyway, I think that's why cheese yeah. is so hard. Yeah, it's incredible. How, how did the two of you get connected for that book? Uh, your book, I wrote it down. I'm going to have it in the show notes. Um, sure. The 21 Day Weight Loss Kickstarter. Yes. So uh, he was coming through town to do a talk, and they wanted a, someone to do a cooking demo. And I was the only one in Phoenix uh, doing this kind of stuff. So I just volunteered to do it. They were going to pay me and I was like, don't worry about it. I'll just, I'll just do it. Uh, and so we became friends through that. And then I started teaching the cancer project classes here in Phoenix for a few years, uh, which later became their food for life program. And, uh, and during that, I just developed tons of new recipes 
every single week um, because I think uh, back then they were kind of in the same boat that a lot of healthy uh, healthy doctors are in where like they're like you have to change your diet here's how you do it but they're not really experts at the here's how you do it part right um, and so you know the the recipes were easy to do but they weren't necessarily great they were just like yeah uh, and so during that class, I just continuously developed stuff that was usually easy to make, but also really spectacular. Um, and then because of that, uh, we just wrote the book together. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, it's just amazing how things, you know, you can make these connections and they just turn into something amazing like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying not to skip around. There's so many things I have to ask you. I have so many notes. It's like, I, I, this is, and like I said, I, I, I was doing the meals for when I was doing the 30 day thing, um, basically for lunch and dinner. Um, and then, um, I started to do them just for lunch because, uh, my partner, Joellen, we were like, we were eating separate times, separate things at dinner. It felt like it wasn't this. Right. You lose the social part. Yeah. And so it's this balance for me. Um, but so I thought at least at a bare minimum, and I think this is one thing that we talk about stepping stones and doing this in stages is that it's worth at least trying to say to yourself, okay, I'm going to eat vegan for lunch. Just take a meal of the right. day and say, this is what I'm going to do. And literally breakfast is super easy because for me, it's, it's, like a vegan smoothie, right? There's nothing. And so I don't have to worry about that. It's not sausage and egg and bacon and all this other stuff. So then you handle the vegan lunch part and you're already better than probably 75% of the world in regards to how healthy you're eating. That's and what then, I think. Right. And then you just, so, and that's kind of the approach I took. I don't know yet, just being honest with you, if I can completely eliminate that occasional steak or burger or and, right. and I, i'm sure i can at some point like for me like you i i refuse to go on medication so i'm 58 years old and i'm like i'm not going on cholesterol medication i don't take anything for high blood pressure i'm not going to do any of that stuff so if it's a if it's food it's going to make the difference then that's the difference that i'll make going to the gym five days a week is already easy for me but if i have to do that and get rid of the burgers and the steaks and whatever, then that's the move that I would make. Right. And if you could make that, uh, if you can make it fun and pleasurable, then why not? Right. It's if a, it's, it's this chore, you know, like most people are going to be like, ah, screw it. I don't want to do it. Uh, <laughs> no, for me, it's, it's talking my girlfriend into to seeing if we can do it together. So that'll be the, that'll be the piece. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about, oh, I also heard an interview where you said that your daughter growing up with two chefs. So is your wife also working with you at either the Vegan Taste or Casa Terra? She, uh, she was, uh, okay. doing the Vegan Taste for a while. Okay. Um, I mean, for, for years she was with me in the kitchen and, uh, and sometimes when I was off doing other stuff, she was running it for months at a time. Got it. Uh, but I, now we're in a situation where it's hard for us to split our time like that. Mm -hmm. And so she takes care of the household and raises our daughter uh, while I take care of the business. Uh, Got it. We tried where we were splitting it both ways. And it was like, uh, uh, I think it's hard to multitask, right? It's hard to be great at a bunch of different stuff at the same time. Uh, and so we just finally decided um, I'll, I'll have to go off and kind of slog it out and be the champion for the business while she's the champion for the uh, keeping the rest of the family sane. Which is a admirable thing for sure. So um, the vegan taste, let's talk about that really quickly. So uh, the vegan taste is home delivery vegan meals that come in these great packages uh that are like you said are the the goal is to heat and eat 
and um, they, I don't know, I'll let you just talk about it because I don't want to, I know I had a certain schedule and the whole thing with the coolers, but I'd like you to describe it so that uh, the audience will know what it's all about and then they can make their decision from there. Yeah, it's uh, it's super easy. So the menu changes every single week. It's a fixed menu. You put your order in by Friday night. Uh, my crew comes into the kitchen on the weekends, uh, it makes everything. Uh, we plate it up uh, over the weekend, pack it up for delivery on Monday, and then my team of drivers go out every Monday and they deliver all the meals at once uh, for your entire week that Monday. Uh, they leave it in a cooler, loaded up with ice packs. So even in the middle of July, the meals will stay chilled until you can pick them up. Uh, and then you put them in your fridge. I know some of our clients will reheat them on the stovetop. Like they'll take the ingredients out and reheat them on the stovetop. But honestly, talking to people, most of them just pop them in the microwave and they have a lunch in two minutes. Yep. And uh, I, those containers are microwavable. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know I've done both. I've Depending on what the food was, sometimes I would heat it on the stove and sometimes I would heat it in the microwave. And I think that's all, also another thing in my brain about microwaves. They, you know, make me a little nervous thinking that maybe something's there that eventually right. someone's going to admit to. So if I, if I have enough time, I'll go to the stove. If I don't, I just use the microwave. I, I'm exactly the same way. Okay. I mean, I don't even have time to cook for myself very much anymore. Right. So, so I use our delivery service for me and, uh, and most of the time I, I just slide the contents out of the container and right into a pan. Yep. So in regards to the meals that are available, is it, um, are they just lunches and dinners? Are they breakfast, lunch, and dinners or? Uh, it's basically lunches and dinners right now, but we'll add in a breakfast option and a juicing option and some desserts pretty soon. Okay. And, and like me, I, at one point I was getting, um, doubles of things so that I could have something for lunch and then something completely for di different for dinner. Um, so I assume you have clients across the board that are only lunch, only dinner, or a combination of enough meals for, f is it how many, how many can yeah. they get? Is it? So yeah, basically we do six different dishes every week and you can get a single portion of each one or you can get a double portion of each one. Okay. And the people that want to have our meals for lunch and dinner get the double portion. Right. And that's what I was doing for a time. That's, that's right. Um, and then in my case, I said that I wanted it spicy, but so you actually keep tabs of certain things that people request on a small, I'd assume a small level because you can't be doing personalized, you know, things across the board for everybody. Yeah, we have uh, a spice is one of the standard options we have for people. Uh, and then we have a gluten-free option, a soy-free option, although we use pretty limited soy already anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, no oil option. The, and the meals, again, are, are pretty much pretty low oil already. So uh, we just talk to people like, do you really, really want no oil? Or is it the say you're trying to minimize your, your oils? Or are you trying to minimize your soy? Are you trying to minimize your gluten? Because we don't, we don't use those types of ingredients heavily in the meal service. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then if there's something that we can leave off as a garnish for someone, like if someone's like, I hate raw onions, I'll tell them, you know, if it's mixed into the dish, we can't change it. But if it's a garnish, we can make a note to leave it off for you. Right. And um, then it, yeah, most people are good about it. But then sometimes I get someone that sends me a list of like 10 different things. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> Thank God I didn't do that. I don't want to sit here and look at you in the camera and go, oh, God, I was one of those people. I <laughs> no, no, no. I think the only thing that I said, everything was great for me. And the only thing I uh, requested, I think, was less tofu in some of my stuff, only because I'm, I, it's just me getting used to it. It's a, mm -hmm. and, and it's not, I, would, I wouldn't even say it's a texture thing for me because I eat oysters, right? That's about as weird of a texture as you can. That's true get so uh, i don't know why i i definitely have had tofu from your food service that was amazing and it's almost like it's firm and some of it some, sometimes is even like crispy like it's it's has mm -hmm. a where i've had it other times where it just just it's just weird yeah i mean I don't know if there's good or bad tofu. Maybe there's just the quality of it. I don't know. It's the way it's the way it's prepared, uh, and I think it's also what you're used to growing up with. 
Uh, I mean, if you're used to growing up with, say, diced up firm tofu and a miso soup, you're not going to bat an eye at it. Uh, but if you're not used to that, the texture might be weird for you. Uh, and I and I think when dealing with American culture where we're not used to that stuff, um, too many people just take tofu and throw it in a soup or a stew and they're like, okay, that's good enough. But it's not. I mean, it's like, to me, that's like throwing in a raw hunk of meat into this something and being like, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's all in the preparation. Okay. Good to know. Cause I, I started to get to like it and thanks to you once again, cause I was definitely, I grew up with in an Italian restaurant family and my father was a chef. And so all of this stuff is new to me. <laughs> I was <laughs> eating pizza and pasta and bread and, and, you name it. So, um, I wanted to, uh, ask you about Casa Terra. I noticed that on the website, like a lot of places, especially during, you know, this time we're living in right now with COVID-19 that the kitchen is closed for the summer. Um, right. That's what it says on the website. Yeah. Is that true. Okay. A, a lot of the high end restaurants, it seems <clears throat> around town actually close up for the summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless there are these big corporate things that can afford to take the loss, the, Restaurants just suffer with the the summer here. Yep. Um, is Casa Terra where you do actually all the food prep and making though? So that that kitchen is still being used for the food delivery service. Yeah, it's our R and D kitchen and our delivery service kitchen. Yep. Uh, we do catering and stuff out of there too. When does the restaurant open, or when do you expect it to open back up uh, in the fall? Or I'm not sure yet. Okay. Um, cause the honest answer is for, uh, for the type of food that we do, our location is not that great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if we can find a location that's more central or on the East side, uh, that makes more sense for us right now than trying to just reopen in Glendale. Sure. And, and Phoenix is a weird city. So we have these really accessible freeways and it's actually pretty easy to get around here, but I, don't know if our food culture is is there yet because if someone has to drive more than 20 minutes here for food um it's painful and they, the chances are they won't do it uh, or if they do it they'll come once a year and uh, uh and so it's it's difficult that way where uh compared to like los angeles or new york or chicago like people will spend an hour getting to uh getting to a place to have dinner um, and if it's a good meal, that's just part of the, it's part of the experience. That might not be a great part of the experience, but it's something they're willing to do. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, so it's we funny. have to be, yeah, we have to be in a more central location. Yeah, because I, I know we're in, and I live in Arcadia and the boundary for me is pretty much like the 51. If it's on the other side of the 51, right. <laughs> I have a hard time going that far west, but I, I understand that. Um. You, one of the things that I did read was that uh, about the, the Cordon Bleu, the school, and it was something about you being, the, was it the first graduate of vegan? Uh, first or, instructor. First instructor of I vegan. I remember when it was either 2007 or 2008, uh, but I was teaching at the Scottsdale Culinary Institute. Yep. And right when I, right when I started teaching there, uh, they became part of the Le Cordon Bleu program. And so I, uh, because of that, I became the first official vegan instructor in that program. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was cool. Yeah. Uh, there's so many things. Uh, the other thing was, I, I remember either hearing or reading that uh, philosophy was your major. Yeah. And I think it, what, what struck me about it when I, when I read it and then who you are and, 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 I even in, there was an interview about making the argument of why to go ve- like how when someone finds something like this and this is why this has been like I, I've wanted to talk about even though I haven't gone full vegan I think that the health benefits are so important and just the, the eliminating of dairy alone I mean I've told people when they said oh yeah you know it sucks getting old you know, and I'm like, yeah, well, I'm 58. I, I, I agree with you, but I don't, I'm, I don't wake up feeling achy and, mm-hmm. and, and I never d- did a lot of dairy, but 
even cutting out what I've already done, I think the inflammation piece of this is what other, you know, is another part that people are missing. I, so, yeah. You know, so getting back to the philosophy part about how you're able to convey this and then not like beating someone over the head with a club, you got to do this. It's, it's the only way your approach to it is your, first of all, your demeanor of how you're, you're, you know, you're a six foot three guy who you, you would never think if I met you in the street would say you're vegan. And then the way you intelligently talk about the food and then the bonus of all of it is how it tastes. And so there's just so many amazing things about this. Um, it's why I was so excited to finally do this. Well, cool. Thank you. So yeah, the, it's, uh, go ahead with the, the, the philosophy part of this, I think has helped a lot. That that's actually what got me to go vegetarian, but also it, it taught me a few things about the way people make decisions because uh, socially and just because of the way I was raised, I didn't want to go vegetarian because it meant changing my lifestyle. Um, and intellectually, I've been kind of bandying it about for a couple months before I, I pulled the trigger on it. Um, and I, I didn't do it. It was just something I had thought about. And then I had an epiphany because I was watching, I was playing with my cat. And I intellectually, I knew my cat is this other being with its own uh, thoughts and her own emotions and stuff. But then there was something where I was just playing with her and I had that emotional epiphany. And that's where it, it went off. And I was like, I understood that my cat was the separate creature that was valuable. And she had her own rich emotional life. And because she was sitting there problem solving and she was getting excited about bringing this little bobble cat back to me and playing fetch with me. Um, it wasn't like this, uh, this robotic, uh, emotionless thinking less piece of matter that like, they, that's how Descartes used to view animals. And that's how he justified doing all these horrible experiments he did on them. Cause he, you know, even though they would, they would scream and all this other stuff, uh, he passed it off as they didn't have a soul and they weren't really conscious and all this other BS. Um, and so, you know, you can intellectually know that, but then you have that understanding and there was that connection. And within a second, I was like, wait a minute, it's not okay for me to just like take a hammer and smash my cat apart right now. That's really like jacked up. That's something serial killers do. Um, why, why can't I do that to my cat? And but why am I paying someone to do it to a cow? And I was like, I have to stop. So I stopped, went vegetarian, and then spent a month arguing against vegetarianism to see if any of the arguments held up. And none of the arguments uh, were self-consistent. And so I was like, I'm going to stay vegetarian. Um, and that was the, the rational part of that. Uh, but, uh, but what I learned was I had to have that emotional epiphany to really make that leap in my decision making. And then when I went vegan, it was even more so because I was doing it for health reasons. And then I found out about factory farming. So it was ironic because being vegetarian for a few years, I had no idea about factory farming. And then all of a sudden I'm looking at vegan for health reasons and I'm learning about factory farming. And I know that it's uh, what happens in a factory farm is horrible and I don't want to partake in it. But yet I'm going out and having all you can eat enchiladas once a week. Because... I emotionally had that tie to the enchiladas and, and so I think for most people, decision-making is a, a pain pleasure balance. And it's, it's a very immediate, um, a very immediate decision. So, and it's funny because people that can make that decision for the long term, we call them wise, right? Cause in the short term, Going out and jogging or lifting weights sucks for most people. Right. But the wise people go out and do that because they know it's going to pay off in the long term. Uh, and, and so I think going through that myself, even though I was trying to be rational about it and I knew what the right decision was and not being able to make it because I had this emotional thing is what got me into food. 
uh, in the first place. Because I knew if I could, if I could take the pain part of that calculus away for people and just give them an environment where they could make a good decision for themselves and for the planet and for the animals, then, uh, then I had to do it. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. I mean, I, I learned so much more about you just doing, you know, the research that I wanted to do up front. And, and I think it's important how the philosophy part of your, what your brain has done through, you know, getting that degree in school. And then, then I heard about the soul sucking marketing job that, you know, oh, man, right. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and it's, and this is, it all plays, this is why this is such a cool interview for me. And I don't want to keep you, you know, any longer. Cause I, I know that, you know, you work really hard and, but I, I would love to do more at some point. Uh, yeah, that'd be you know, fun. it's just cool that you, you are doing your passion. It, it really means a lot to you. you 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 know, you eat, sleep and breathe what you preach but you preach it in a way that it's not preaching. Um, uh, the food tastes amazing. Uh, it was just a godsend for me to find it. Uh, we find out tonight as you're, we're setting up here to get ready to talk, you play the drums. It's like, what, what more of a kinship could we possibly have? Um, and all I do is try to preach on my podcast and on my, you know, social media and all that is just people following their dream. And it's really cool to see you do this. It's, it's, it's great. And, and I'm glad you're healthy. I'm glad you made the choice when you did, you're here to yeah. help keep us all healthy and feed us. Well, it's funny. So it, it's, it's funny you brought that up because I feel like I'm in another transition point in what I'm doing because I, uh, you know, I, I had this amazing journey where I, I lost all this weight. I cured my diabetes, uh, became a chef and went and helped out other people. And in the last couple of years, my, uh, my health started to decline. And I was like, what's going on? Because I'm eating right. But there's, there's all this other stuff. So, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, in the last couple of years, I almost got divorced. I was working a hundred hours a week. I was doing all this other, other stuff. I was, um, you know, we went to set up to open up this restaurant. We had some guys steal about 50 K from us and steal. Oh, uh, and he, he probably cost us about 200 grand in the long term, um, which was almost all my family's money and, uh, almost all of my best friend's money that she had. And then we opened up this uh, open up this restaurant, which, um, uh, you were in the restaurant business. So, you know, like it is a lot of work. And on top of that, we're doing these other businesses. And so there are all these other stressors. And I realized it, it actually happened, uh, right when COVID hit, because we were thinking about, like, we were really looking forward to the summer when we could shut the restaurant down for a while and get a breather. And then COVID hit. And all of a sudden, oddly, my life got better because I was spending time with my family and I wasn't killing myself anymore. And my health started to improve. And I was like, that was it. I had this very narrow focus in my life, which I was really good at, but it also carried all the stress that I think, uh, I think you have when you get a little bit older in your career. And you're kind of at the, you're operating at a higher level. It's also a more stressful level. And there's a lot more at stake at that point. Um, and so when COVID hit, I had more time for my family. And then I started going on bike rides again and hiking. And I started spending time playing the drums. I hadn't touched uh, my drum set in three years. Wow. Um, and I started playing again, which was actually cool. I, I have this thing where I get, I stop something. For a while, when I pick it up, I'm better at it. So now I can actually play some of the Rush songs that I couldn't get through nice. three years ago. <laughs> I'm like, where did this come from? That's awesome. Um, uh, you know, so that was cool. And so, uh, so I realized, like, I've been talking about environment with food choices, uh, but I've been ignoring everything else that goes into being a healthy person. Um, taking care of your mental state, taking care of your family, making sure you have time to not be insane with all this other, 
other stuff. And so uh, I, I think my career is shifting into a point where I'm going to start talking about more about holistic uh, health and creating good environments for your, uh, for your well-being um, as an adult. It's, I'm sure it's true for, for a kid or whatever part you're in, but since I'm in my, my 40s and kind of went through the midlife crisis part, um, that's how I solved it was figuring out that I had to create a good environment to make good choices uh, throughout my whole life and not just with the food. Cause I had just been concentrated on the food and that was just one key. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how many people, I, I know it's, it's hurt a lot of people, but I personally, it's been the best three months in so long cause I was running so hard. And like I said, I've gotten to, to do things that I want to do. I, 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 it's just, it, it's been a good thing and I'm glad to hear that everything is uh, turning back around for you too, as well. I, I worried about you when it happened, to be honest, because, you know, I, I know it devastated the event world for me, I mean, everything just stopped. Um, and so I was worried just purely whether or not, uh, you know, how, how well you would do during that time. And it's funny, speaking of, you know, COVID-19, was there any concerns about, you know, your clients with the food delivery and any, any things that you had to do differently in order to, to be, you know, follow the CDC guidelines or anything like that? Uh, we just did extra sanitation, but we were already doing that stuff anyway. Right. Um, we were just more hardcore about it than normal, but that was it. Uh, cause I think with the, the food delivery, it's contactless. So yep. our drivers just show up and, Drop the cooler at their doorstep yep. and, and head out. Yep. Uh, so, so in a way it didn't really affect the, the delivery service at all. Yeah. It was horrible for the restaurant, but that ended up being a boon for us personally. Yep. Yeah. <coughs> well, awesome, man. I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you're here. Uh, I, like I said, I was disappointed when I had to sort of postpone it last time. I just took on too much. It was one of those deals where I thought I could, I forget how much time post-production takes after I get off this thing to, to get it, uh, you know, ready for prime time. But, um, I am super, super grateful that you said yes. And you came on. Um, I love your food and, uh, you're an amazing human being. Uh, the more I've done the research and get to know you now. And, uh, it sounds like your daughter is definitely waiting for you to put her to bed. <laughs> So I'm glad I'm, I'm, I could go on. I swear to God for another hour. There's so many questions about food and, and just things that you've done, but we'll do it another time for sure. Yeah, that'll be fun. I'd love to come back. Uh, I, again, I can't thank you enough. It's an honor to have you on here and uh, I'd love to have you back again. Um, just for uh, the audience sake and, and things like that, um, where's the best place to get in touch with you? And I'll put, I'll do, you know, in the show notes, I'll list every you know your social media things but like in regards to let's say the vegan taste what's the best way for people to reach out uh just go right to the vegan taste.com okay perfect i mean we have all the social media platforms yeah. but uh it seems like you know facebook changes yeah. what they want to show to people every few months and yep. uh instagram is the same way and you know all these other ones so just just go straight to the vegan taste.com Perfect. I'll put in all the other links. I'll take care of all of that. Um, again, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's so, I, I look forward to actually meeting you live in person. Maybe we can sit around and jam one night. That would be awesome. I would love it. So cool. All right. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Have a good night. You too. Thank you so very much for listening to this podcast. It's so important to me that you've taken the time out to listen and potentially subscribe. If you have a moment, it would be great if you could share this podcast. I would also love it if you could rate it. And if you have time, it would be amazing to have a review by you. Once again, thanks so much for listening. I really, really appreciate having you here and being in your ears. Mm-hmm.